I suppose it's kind of strange that in the week uh, when Stan Lee dies, I choose to do a comic for my talk, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, because Stan Lee always believed in diversity, and so do I. But I've got a bit of a tough message to begin with, and that's in the DC universe, Superman is dead. In fact, in our universe, superheroes don't exist at all. But heroes do. And the challenge that our heroes of today face is about building effective communities, especially in areas of high deprivation. From my frame of reference in rugby, and that's the, the sport which I'm deeply involved with, with my community, we have a number of values, but we also have diversity. Whether you're big, you're small, you're fast, you're slow, it doesn't matter. Everybody's got a position to play both on and off the pitch. So let's just have a quick thought, think about those values. I want to put those up front in your mind so we can go through them. And when we meet our villains in our comic book story, teamwork, respect, enjoyment, discipline, and sportsmanship. So I want you to meet Dan. Dan's a bit of a good guy. He likes to keep himself fit. He goes running. He likes to listen to self-improving podcasts. And the one he's listening to at the moment is one uh, around uh, communities. And the person who's speaking is a guy called Brett Powells. He's an experimental psychologist in uh, St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. And Powells talks about four key barriers to communities. And you could call them the villains in our story. Because the reason why they're so powerful is that they're unconscious. They're unseen, they're hidden, and they hide inside many, many people. And he listens, and he hears about the first one, which is the locus of control, which is a continuum from the left-hand side, you could say, which is where people believe that their path is fixed, their fate is determined, and nothing they will ever do will ever change that. To the right-hand side, where you have people who have grasped and dominated their locus of control, and that's where volunteers sit. That perception about whether you make that change, whether it's big or small, is something that every single person can dominate in their locus of control. And it's through teamwork, respect, some hard craft and some discipline that you can defeat this supervillain. And I think this is where volunteers start to win that battle. Dan, listen to the next part, and that's about learned helplessness. When people say things like, do you remember the way how things used to be? Or, why can't things be like that again? Or, oh, we tried that, but it didn't really work, so don't bother trying. It's pretty obvious that level of collected self-defeat will erode a community's sense of pride and self-worth. When you have studies such as the What About You survey by the NHS or the European Health Interview Survey, both of them have stated that if there's an absence of spirit and identity within a community, then those people that live in those communities get affected by it, especially those that grow up in it. So you could say there's a lack of enjoyment. But Dan, he's not deterred. He carries on running and he listens and he hears about functional fixedness. This is the next villain in our story. Or to put it another way, you could call it points of reference. As we grow, we learn new skills. We learn solutions to problems. And we like it. We get that sense of self-worth. But what happens when the situation changes and adapts and those solutions and skills are no longer relevant or don't work anymore? it's pretty clear that that's a way how you can lose your motivation to want to continue and do these things. But through some discipline to keep going, to keep adapting, to keep managing that change and not letting up and making that change stick, that's how you defeat this supervillain. And then you have the bystander effect, or you could call it moral courage. Every time that you see something that's not good and you let it go on by, that's the bystander effect. And every time that you do that, you're withdrawing from that bank of moral courage. But every time you do intervene, you do a good thing, like pick up that piece of litter or step in into something that's not quite right. Then you make a deposit. But here's the thing. The deposit will always be smaller than the withdrawal. So it's hard. So that takes discipline and sportsmanship, that fairness in society, because people of integrity are people of worth. And that's the way how you defeat this supervillain. But our hero, he's not deterred. He, he's still in there. He still believes that he wants to do something. He's pretty motivated. But he knows he can't do it alone. So he starts to look around, and he starts to look for new community organisations that he could join. Now, 
He finds a local rugby club because he used to play rugby when he was at school. He enjoyed it and he had some fun. But he wanted to understand why that club exists. What's its role? Now, from my point of reference, and I speak about my club, Painted and Rugby, the reason why we exist is not the obvious answer. It's not about a small section of society watching a bloke with a whistle shouting at 30 other people with strange terms such as rucking, mauling and scrumming. It's actually about building a better community for the betterment of all around it. It's about instilling those values of self-worth and pride to build a collective community the way we support each other, where people make friends for life, where we look out for each other. That's why we exist. When you look at our values, our how, teamwork, respect, enjoyment, discipline, and sportsmanship, these are the bedrock of how we exist. In teamwork, it's important. Like I said before, the value of rugby, which I love the most, is diversity. No matter what size you are, no matter who you are, there's a position to play on and off the pitch. From the players, the coaches, the team managers, the board of directors, they're all volunteers. They're all people who have dominated and grasped their locus of control. And they're the people who want to give up a piece of their time in order to achieve the betterment of others. I want to give you a really good example about how teamwork can really work well in a community. Way back in 2011, there was a, a flanker who played for Australia, and his name's Scott Fardy. And he went to go and play overseas in Japan. He played for a team called the Kamachi Sea Waves. And in 2011, an earthquake struck the local area. It was called the Chihuku earthquake. You can look it up. And the 40,000 residents of Kamachi were then hit for five minutes with this earthquake. And then the resulting tsunami that came after killed 1,250 of its residents. And in this shocking de devastation, the overseas players of the Kamachi Sea Waves were offered safe passage out and repatriation back home. But Fardy refused. He stayed. And he stayed with his team to make sure that they were OK. And then the team rallied. And then they worked with the emergency services for a month to help the ease the suffering of others in their local community. And then the community saw it. And then they turned around, and after their suffering was eased, they then helped rebuild the Kamashi Seaway Stadium so that six weeks later, they were playing their first pre-season games with some of their highest attendance. But they didn't stop. They then carried on and now improved that stadium so much that the Rugby World Cup next year, which is being held in Japan, though some of those games are playing, being played in the Kamashi Seaway Stadium because it's now at international standard. And their motto now has changed to rebuilding through rugby. That's teamwork. It's also about respect. Respect for oneself. For the players of whom you play with, recognising that everyone's got individual talents. It's respect for the officials. It's respect for the people, who, for the, the coaches who go out there and give up their time. For the parents who stand out on those cold winter afternoons and evenings, watching their kids play and supporting from the sidelines. It's about respect for the grounds people who work and go and give the facilities for us to play. All of those things create a community, a strong value where we recognise the contribution of every single person. Of course, it has to be fun, enjoyment. Everyone, especially at youth area, gets half a game to play. So no matter how good or bad you are, it doesn't matter. You get the opportunity to be included and you get to improve. And that's being part of the community, where we help each other out. The practice of we, not me. There's discipline. That's not just turning up for training and making sure that you do all the right things and you follow the rules of play and all that sort of stuff. But it's also about the discipline, about making sure that when you do the tackle, that not only are you safe, but the person you're tackling is safe. And that's why, believe it or not, per capita, there are less injuries in rugby than there are in basketball and football. So then you have an interesting part about that discipline, also about making sure you learn the values of sportsmanship, of where that sense of fairness exists in our society, of where we make sure that we follow that, those rules of play, but also it's fair and equitable for all. So Dan, he sees the why. He's got his why, he wants to make a change. He can see the why in his local rugby club about the betterment of the community for all. He's got a how, which is the values of rugby, teamwork, respect, enjoyment, discipline, and sportsmanship. But he also needs a framework of how we can do 
those values. Now, he works in technology, and he recognizes uh, a change management technique that he's learned along the way, and that's called Cotter's Eight Steps, and it's an infinite loop that continues going on over and over again about how you can bring about change. And that infinite loop starts off by setting a sense of urgency. And he's got that. He's got that motivation. He can see that there is buy-in from the leadership and peers in the rugby club about wha what they want to do, about making that community happen. He sees there's a vision that's been set. It's very clearly articulated. There are posters up. People talk about it in the, in the language. They see it's been communicated. And he dives into the world of the social media. And they can see the club dives into the world of social media, speaking to those people about these things. It's been communicated. But the last three steps are up to him, about setting those short-term goals to progress to get there, about not letting up, keeping it going, and finally making the change stick. And then that process will start all over again. So now he's got the why, he's got the how, he's got the framework, but he really wants to understand what it is he's really doing and what benefits and impacts he's bringing. So he does some more research. And he starts looking about the impact of youth isolation and mental health in youth. And he looks and he doesn't like what he sees. He reads a report called the Deloitte State of Smart Report, which was in 2017, that said that 66% of 16 to 19 year olds, when they go to bed, they will wake up in the middle of the night to go and check their smartphone to see whether they've got any messages. And 26% of them will actively respond. Now, the impact of that is not only a, an increase of the addiction to a naturally occurring drug called dopamine, which we all produce, that when you have feelings of or a lack of self-worth and self-pride, you become more and more addicted to dopamine for that instant gratification hit. And when you're not learning those coping strategies through winning and losing and the community spirit of coming together and making those meaningful relationships, you become more addicted to dopamine. He doesn't like this. He realizes there's a challenge here that getting hold of these screenagers and helping them is a key factor. There's also the physical attributes as well. That when you have broken sleep during those adolescent growing years, you're actually retarding physical growth. You're also making yourself more tired, so your ability to learn then becomes more and more disruptive. He then carries on and looks at the physical health aspects. And he looks at primary school kids, and he sees that in reception, one in five children in the UK, when they enter reception, are obese. They don't have access to physical sport. That increases to one in three when they leave primary school at year six. And that's because there's that instant gratification, that passing off of kids watching TV and parental TV via Netflix and other things, rather than bringing them out to doing community sport. When you look at the local area, we have 550 members in Paynton Rugby. Two in five of those live in England's top three most deprived areas in the country. The statistics say that if you live in one of those areas, the amount of potential life, uh, uh, years of life lost is 7.9% above the national average. So giving people access to physical activity, to community sports and community organisations is absolutely key to get people out there. That means there's been a 45% increase in Torbay's children living in those areas. That means one in four, one in four live in those areas. And they're the people we must speak to. And that NHS study that I was talking about before said that if community sports organisations and community organisations don't exist or declined in these areas, that impact would be felt directly and quickly. He continues to look at how mental health is on the rise in teenagers in the UK and work globally today. And that's partly through this instant gratification hit from social media. But it's not necessarily the smartphone's fault. Believe me, I love them. Yeah, I use them a lot. And the way how I communicate with these people as the director of communications at Peyton Rugby is through social media. But it's about temperance and control. So Dan, he starts to make that transformation towards becoming a hero. He masters his locus of control. He understands his why. He understands the rugby club's why. He's got his how of those values of teamwork, respect, enjoyment, discipline, and sportsmanship. He's got his framework from Cotter's eight steps. 
He's got his what? How to become an assistant youth coach at the rugby club. And that transformation begins. He joins, he then goes through that development, and this is part of the values of rugby, where you continually develop as a coach, where you go on continual courses so you stay current, competent and qualified. He gets better, he gets stronger in what he does. As a result, the team that he works with gets bigger and more and more kids engage. He engages with them on social media and speaks their language, but draws them in and starts to bring them those values. That hero is born. But he doesn't stop there. He remembers Cotter's eight steps because he's got to make that change stick, that last eight step. And that cycle begins again because Dan, he's now looking for the next hero. And that next hero could be any person in this room. It could be many people in this room. Because I once sat where you sat. I was Dan. Thank you. <laughs>